Hello? Oh, it's working. OK. So uh, I know this isn't you know, an algebraic geometry conference. And so you should uh, feel free to interrupt me at any point if you have questions. And I'll try to give some more algebraic geometry background uh, because of that. So uh, first of all, what are the objects of interest? So let me give the following definition. A K3 surface is a compact complex surface um, S such that uh, pi 1 of S is trivial and the canonical bundle of S is uh, the trivial bundle. OK, so you know, when I say complex surface, I mean a four manifold. And uh, what does it mean that the canonical bundle is trivial? Uh, it just means that uh, there is a holomorphic two form, a non vanishing. holomorphic two form, let me call it omega s on s. So uh, this is an example. This is an example of uh, Kalabi Yau, which is an important class of algebraic varieties. Um, which are the ones that have a non-vanishing holomorphic top form. This is, has non-vanishing holomorphic top form. So for instance, in the case of a curve, a complex, a compact complex curve, um, we would have, you know, the elliptic curve as the example of a Clabio. So let me give an example of a K3 surface. So for instance, if we take uh, x1 to the fourth plus x2 to the fourth plus x3 to the fourth plus x4 to the fourth equals 0, so this locus of points in three-dimensional complex projective space, then uh, this would be an example of a K3 surface, is a K3 surface. So um, we're going to be interested in K3 surfaces that can be embedded into a projective space. Uh, so let me give the following definition. A K3 of degree 2D is a pair uh, of a K3 surface and a line bundle, so L an ample line bundle. such that if we take the first churn class of the line bundle uh, and we take its self-intersection, we get uh, 2D. OK, so let me just remark a little bit about, um, about this. Well, this compact complex surface is a four manifold, right? So there's, a, there's an intersection form. on H2 with coefficients in Z. And this just given by you know, the inner product of two cohomology classes is the integral over the surface of alpha wedge beta. And so this is a symmetric um, 
bilinear non-degenerate and unimodular pairing by Poincaré duality on this four manifold. And so uh, what is the rank of this? It's uh, of it's a Z module of rank 22. And uh, a symmetric, I'll call us, you know, a Z module with a symmetric bilinear uh, pairing a lattice. So what is this lattice? Um, yeah, what is the intersection form? Well, this Z to the 22 is isomorphic to three copies of a certain rank 2 lattice and two copies of a certain rank 8 lattice. So this is where uh, H is the lattice whose um, bilinear form is encoded by this matrix. And E8 is the E8 lattice. <laughs> lattice. Maybe I should put a negative here. So uh, if you think of the E8 lattice as a positive definite lattice, I want the, the pairing where I negate the value of the intersection form. OK. Are there any questions about that so far? Um, everything makes sense? Why is it 22? Why is it 22? Um, well, all K3 surfaces can be deformed to each other. They're all deformation equivalent. Uh, so topologically, they all have the same underlying manifold. You could call it the K3 manifold. And you, know, you can take a specific example and compute its second Betty number. It also follows from Riemann Ruck and like Noether's formula, and there's there's many ways to see it. Um, you can compute the Hodge numbers, for instance, of the surface. Maybe I should mention that the Hodge numbers, you know, H20, H11, H02 here, are 1, 20, 1. Yeah, absolutely. OK, so actually, let me give a name to this lattice. Uh, I'm going to call it uh, 2 sub 3 comma 19. So it's the unique, even unimodular lattice of signature 319. So yeah, that's, an, that's important to note that this, this lattice has, maybe I should say, signature, signature uh, 319. So the sort of main theorem, or uh, uh, one of the most important theorems about K3 surfaces is the Torelli theorem. Um, Uh, so what does it say? It says that S1 is isomorphic to S2 if and only if there exists an isometry, let's call it phi, from H2 of S1 coefficients in Z to uh, H2 of S2 with coefficients in Z such that the line spanned by the class of the holomorphic two form is equal to the line spanned by the class of the holomorphic two form. So the holomorphic two form is a closed two form, in particular represents a cohomology class in the complex cohomology. And you know, maybe I should say that you know you tensor this with C, you get an isomorphism of the complex cohomology. And these, if these classes are identified by, these, by this isometry, the two surfaces are isomorphic. 
Okay, so, but there's sort of a problem with this. Um, so what's the problem? Well, so, so what we can conclude from this is that plus a surjectivity statement, the set of isomorphism types of K3s uh, is given by the set of X in the projectivization of this lattice censored with C. So this is the collection of complex lines um, such that x dot x equals 0 and x dot x bar is positive. Um, modulo the action of the orthogonal group of this lattice. So why do I have these two properties? Uh, just because you know the integral of omega wedge omega is 0, and the integral of omega wedge omega bar is positive. OK, so you can see this by, for instance, identifying by some fixed isometry the cohomology with this lattice and then sort of modding out by all the possible identifications. But this is a very bad space. This is not Hausdorff, for instance, because uh, this group acts, you know, it doesn't act properly discontinuously on this set. Uh, but for polarized K3s, the situation is a lot better. So for polarized K3, um, we choose a V in this lattice such that v squared is equal to 2d. And then when we, if we identify, so if we identify h2 of this surface uh, with this lattice, we can choose an identification such that the line bundle, or rather c1 of the line bundle, is sent to the class v. And furthermore, um, So omega, uh, the class of omega intersected with C1 of L is equal to 0. Because the class of the holomorphic line bundle is a 1-1 one, one class, and the holomorphic 2 form represents a 2-0 class. So we conclude that um, so the moduli of polarized K3s, which I'll denote F2D, is isomorphic to um, the set of X. Now we can projectivize not the full lattice, but the perp of this vector V, since our holomorphic 2 form is going to land in the perp of that vector. V perp tensor C, such that x dot x equals 0, and x dot x bar is positive. And now, instead of modding out by all of O of 219, we can just mod out by O of the lattice V perp. And this is a nice space. So uh, in fact, this part I'm going to call D. and this group I'll call gamma. So this is a quotient of a Hermitian symmetric domain by um, an arithmetic group acting on it. And so you get an orbifold as the quotient, and everything is very nice. So, so the conclusion is that F2D is a complex orbifold of dimension 19. Are there questions so far about K3 surfaces? 
uh, moduli. Hmm? And uh, and Shafarid, yeah. yeah. And Peter's Luyenga also have the proof. But Totally, yeah. So it's not clear that every x, I mean, obvious, it's hard to see why every x is realizable, you know. And so, of course, that requires proof. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe I should just erase the attribution. And, you know, it's, it's one of those theorems that's like so. It's now part of the general knowledge, so you know it doesn't have to be cited. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um. <laughs> oh, and on, on the subject of attribution, like once, so this is all things that are known. But once we get to new things, I should mention that this is joint work uh, with. Um, Valery Alexeyev and uh, Alan Thompson. All right, so we have this nice moduli space of polarized K3 surfaces of any given degree, but it's not compact. So F2D is not compact. There are cusps of you know, the action of gamma on this symmetric space. And you know, that presents sort of a problem because, well, like if you want to do intersection theory on the moduli space, for instance, you need a compact moduli space to make sure that intersections don't run off to infinity. There are lots of reasons why you would want a compactification. And so, for instance, you know, for curves, there's the Deline Mumford compactification. And people got a lot of mileage out of that, obviously, um, having the existence of a nice compactification such that the boundary points represent something reasonable. OK, so I want to talk about just uh, some Hodge theoretic compactifications. So I'm not going to go into too much detail about toroidal compactifications. But I'll just sort of outline the necessary parts. So how do you compactify this moduli space? Well, there's an infinite number of ways to do it. Uh, but it corresponds to some linear algebraic data. So OK, let's let. Yeah, what, what do I want to say? So for each gamma orbit of primitive isotropic vector, so primitive meaning not a multiple of another vector isotropic being norm 0, let's call it a delta. in um, v perp, uh, I require the data of a stabilizer of delta invariant. So I'll say why I require this data in a second. A stabilizer of delta invariant polyhedral decomposition of the positive cone of delta perp mod delta. So uh, with this data, 
of such a polyhedral decomposition of the positive cone of delta pert mod delta for each uh, orbit of primitive isotropic vector, there's going to be a compactification of the moduli space of K3 surfaces. So let's just check. Hmm? Integral, yeah, primitive. Uh, in, yeah, in v, for v perp, I always mean the lattice v perp, not the, the real perp. Sorry? Yeah, this here required the data of a stabilizer. So to define a toroidal compactification of the moduli space, um, I require the data of a stabilizer of delta invariant polyhedral decomposition of the positive cone of delta pert mod delta. So, yeah, so let's unpack exactly what that means. So this, first of all, v perp, this has signature 219. And so if I take delta perp mod delta, delta is an isotropic vector in v perp, that will reduce the positive signature by one and the negative signature by one. So this is a lattice of signature 118. So for any isotropic vector, uh, I can produce in v perp, I can produce this lattice of signature 118. OK, so that's hyperbolic space, right? Um, so if we take the positive cone, so here's the positive cone. Um, let me give the positive cone a name, maybe C sub delta. So here's C sub delta. And uh, so let me draw the projectivization. The projectivization of this positive cone is hyperbolic space of dimension 18. And then I have this group, the stabilizer of delta, which acts on um, this 18-dimensional hyperbolic space. And what you need to define a compactification of the moduli space is a polyhedral decomposition of this hyperbolic space you know, by 18-dimensional uh, hyperbolic polyhedra such that uh, it, that decomposition is preserved by the group gamma. And there's some other further restrictions. So for instance, there should only be finitely many orbits of facets of this polyhedral decomposition. Uh, yeah, so it has to be a rational polyhedral decomposition. Yeah. Huh? Um, are the, you mean like are the polyhedra? Yeah, they're they're generated by like finitely many rays, say. But like the ray, it, it, you know, if the if the hyperbolic manifold. H18 mod the stabilizer of gamma is cusped, you know, then there should be some cusps on some of these polyhedra also. And certainly it will be, yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. That's right. So, okay, some cusps. That's right. Yeah, so any such tessellation of that hyperbolic manifold produces some compactification of the moduli space. And the sort of property of the compactification that you produce is that the top dimensional cells correspond to points in the boundary. The, uh, you know, the co-dimension one cells correspond to copies of C star in the boundary. The co-dimension two cells to C star squared, et cetera. So these are all like uh, tori, which is why it's called a toroidal compactification. Okay, so. That's right, yeah. 
Yes, that's right. Yeah, so there's only finitely many orbits of primitive isotropic vectors. And so for each one, I want like a tessellation of this hyperbolic manifold. So the problem with this, so this compactifies the moduli space. So this compactifies F2D. But uh, generally, the compactification isn't modular. So, so I want to explain what I mean by that. So what you really want of a compactification of some moduli space of things is that uh, you know, if you take this compact moduli space that contains your thing as an open set, that this compact thing parameterizes some generalization of a K3 surface. You know, so that there's some geometric objects that this parameterizes. So for MG bar, you have stable curves as the generalization of smooth curves. And, you know, so yeah, what do I mean by this? I, it's not really a precise term, but I just mean that um, the boundary parameterizes something. It does, yeah. So it's the, it, that's, um, yeah. So it generates like the, um, it's like the vanishing torus of like the deepest stratum of a degeneration is this delta. It's the class, it's a vanishing cycle of the degeneration, yeah. I mean, you know that that's true somehow for any degeneration, but that's still not exactly specifying what the degenerate thing is. You know, it's just saying that there is this vanishing cycle. Like the vanishing cycle is visible even on the level of the punctured family um, from the monodromy. Okay, so, so that's the issue. So let's sort of specialize to the degree two case. Um, so this is particularly nice because there exists a unique orbit of primitive isotropic vector um, delta. And furthermore, this delta perp mod delta is a hyperbolic root lattice. So I want to sort of describe this lattice explicitly. Um, so we can. Is it what? No, it's not. So uh, this is inside. Uh, if we take v perp, that's a lattice of index two, and so delta perp mod delta will also be a lattice of index two. So it's very close to being unimodular, but it's not unimodular. Um, okay, so here's this picture. Um, so essentially, what this picture is describing is 24 vectors of norm minus 2 that generate this lattice. So the lattice is only rank 19, right? This is of signature uh, 118. So this is more than is necessary to generate the lattice. This isn't a basis of the lattice. But uh, what, does, what does this picture mean? So there's some collection of vectors, ri, from i equals 0 to 23, 24 vectors. And if they're connected by an edge, then uh, the inner product of, so first of all, all their squares are minus 2, their roots. If uh, they're connected by an edge, their inner product is 1. If they're not connected by an edge, their inner product is 0. Um, a double edge and their inner product is 2. Um, yeah. 
And so yeah, I can leave off. I'll just say in words, uh, the double edges indicate that the inner product is two, and the dotted edge indicates that the inner product is six between those two roots. So uh, the dimension of the lattice is 19. That's right. So there's linear relations. There are five linear relations amongst the RI. But this is a particularly nice presentation of this lattice. So I mean, it's, you know. If you took the uh, gram matrix indicated by this picture, you would find that it has a five-dimensional kernel, um, you know, because the vectors which correspond to a linear combination that equals zero in the lattice, you know. Yeah, mod, mod out by, say, the kernel of the intersection form. Yeah, that's right. Um, OK, so that's, that's this lattice. And we need a uh, stabilizer of delta invariant polyhedral decomposition of the positive cone. And there's a very nice one. So gamma, uh, sorry, the stabilizer of delta, OK, no, that's not exactly right. Let me say gamma delta, which is the subgroup of SO118, um, which is the image of the stabilizer of delta. So you know, there are some elements of the stabilizer that are in the unipotent subgroup, so they act trivially. Um, on hyperbolic space, but uh, so let's call this the image of the stabilizer of delta, and it contains as an index six subgroup W, which is the reflection group generated by these Ri's. So this is in general difficult to check for a hyperbolic root lattice, you know, does the reflection group generate um, the, like, a finite index subgroup of the isometry group, but uh, there's Vinberg's algorithm, which you can run to determine whether that's the case. So this is using some criteria of Vinberg. And now, uh, let me uh, take K to be a fundamental domain for this action of W. So this is just the x in delta perp mod delta, such that x dot ri is positive, non-negative for all i. So by the way, this index 6 thing corresponds to the symmetries of the diagram. Uh, there's an S3 group of symmetries of the diagram. So the diagram automorphisms are not in the group, um, but you know, there's a normal subgroup and it's an S3 extension. OK, so uh, then we can just take W dotted with this fundamental domain. And this is a gamma delta invariant um, decomposition of H18. So this is probably the most natural uh, fan uh, that you could describe, the most natural polyhedral decomposition and toroidal compactification. Uh, but then you want to show that it also parameterizes some generalizations of a K3 surface. Are there questions about, uh, about that so far? So. How do you what? Yeah, so essentially, yeah, let's sort of draw a picture. Here's our H18. We just take these 24 roots right here, and we take the positive half space of all of those roots. So like, you know, R0 perp is here, R1 perp. Since all these vectors have negative norm, their perps intersect the positive cone. Um, and the result is some sort of, so this is our sort of polyhedral fundamental domain K. 
and it has 24 codimension one walls. Um, and then, you know, to get our polyhedral decomposition, which is invariant under the group, we can just take this K and reflect it across it, all of its walls successively, and it'll tessellate um, hyperbolic space. Yeah, so, I mean, right, so I haven't explained yet how you construct, um, like, a, the singular, anal, you know, generalization of a K3 surface that will sort of extend over this toroidal compactification, but, yeah, a key part of it is that, so, actually, maybe I should have mentioned this before, like, every degree to K3 surface, so, so fact, every degree to K3 surface is a double cover of P2, CP2, branched over a sextic curve. So for instance, you know, if you wanted to describe an equation um, and maybe I should say is canonically the double cover of P2 branched over a sextic curve. So for instance, we could take the equation z squared is equal to x naught to the 6 plus x1 to the 6 plus x2 to the 6, where these x naught x1, x2, are in CP2. So, you know, in general, um, you know, when the value of this uh, is non-zero, there will be two points that lie over that point of CP2. And, you know, when it's zero, which is where the sextic vanishes, you know, you'll have only one inverse image. So this K3 surface, S, you know, it has a map pi, which is 2 to 1, to CP2, which is just to forget Z. Um, and the pullback of the line bundle O of 1 on CP2 uh, is the polarization L. Yeah, so. Um, to sort of understand um, why this uh, toroidal compactification associated to um, this polyhedral decomposition is, is relevant, you kind of need to, um, you need to use the geometry of this, of this picture. So yeah, maybe remark, there is, um, a curve, uh, let's say, a natural, uh, maybe canonical, I can say canonical again, um, choice of curve um, on S, uh, the branch locus of this map. So that's uh, pi inverse. Uh, set theoretically, it's pi inverse of, you know, um, the sextic. But one interesting thing is that this uh, this canonical choice of curve. Um, let me call this branch locus B, maybe. Um, B is not in the linear system of the line bundle. It's, it's one half 
of the pullback of the sex stick. So it's actually in three times the linear system. So it's in, it's a section of, you know, the tensor cube of the original line bundle. But it's completely canonical on any degree two uh, K3 surface. So um, there are compactifications Um, of pairs, uh, so you can take the pair of the surface and this branch locus, and uh, this is of log general type, which concretely means that the canonical bundle of S plus B is ample. This is true because the canonical bundle of the K3 is just trivial. And so um, there's machinery that was like built by, um, so there's these uh, KSBA, so this is uh, Kolar, uh, Shepard Baron, and Alexeyev, um, machinery to compactify um, varieties of log general type, moduli of varieties. So without going into too much detail of this machinery, um, maybe I can sort of state the main theorem. Um, I have uh, myself, Thompson. The compactification F2 bar associated to the reflection group um, admits a morphism to the uh, KSBA compactification. And so in particular, there is a family, sort of maybe you could say a natural family, living over this toroidal compactification. And furthermore, you know, we've sort of analyzed, so there's a morphism here, and there are some positive dimensional fibers on the boundary. But in general, we know what those fibers are. So the fibers are of dimension 0, 1, 2, or 3, and we sort of know what gets contracted. Yeah, so, so it's a family of log general type varieties. Um, so I, yeah, I will actually explicitly describe the fibers over the boundary. Um, but yeah, so it, it fits into this general framework, but you can also just concretely describe the objects that live over the boundary. Okay, so. Yeah. Well, you could, you could subdivide the tessellation, for instance, and you would still get, or you could choose a different fundamental domain for the group action. Um, so there is no way of the tessellation that we can say 
Um, yeah, so it's a little bit tricky. What's happening here is that there's, there's this machinery, which is kind of technical of semi-toric compactifications. And this is isomorphic to one of these semi-toric compactifications. And essentially what happens is that you have this reflection group, but you take a certain subset of roots, and then you take your fundamental domain and reflect it successively only using those roots. And then you get this infinite chamber, and you can apply this machinery of semi-toric compactifications. And for that infinite chamber, the semi-toric compactification is isomorphic to this. KSBA. But it's the, the simpler way to state it is just that there's a morphism because somehow this semi-toric thing, it's infinite chamber. If you further subdivide that infinite chamber, you can get to this reflection um, chamber. Yeah, so yeah, so what I'm gonna describe next is like how the story is kind of analogous to the case of abelian varieties. Yeah, so this is, uh, yeah, this is a projective, this is a projective variety. Hmm? Both of them, yeah, both, yeah. So if you are you know, sick of K3 surfaces, you can clear your mind entirely, and we'll start talking about something seemingly completely unrelated. So, uh, and that's uh, integral affine structures on the sphere. So let me give the following definition. Uh, an integral affine structure say on a real surface. So now I'm talking about, you know, real surfaces B is a collection of charts to R2 whose transition functions are in the integral affine group. So is a collection of charts to R2 with transition functions in the group SL2Z, uh, semi-direct R2. So stupidest example is, uh, say, R2 itself. It has a single chart to R2, no transition functions. Um, R2 modulo any lattice, for instance, is an integral affine structure. Um, the transition functions are just translations, so there's no SL2Z component. Um, maybe a slightly more interesting example is, you know, I could quotient, I could identify this side to this side by the identity, but then I could identify these two sides of this rectangle by like 1K01 for some integer K. So this would be uh, an integral affine structure on the two torus, um, but you know it's not, um, you know, it's not realized as a quotient by translations, obviously, because this has non-trivial monodromy. So uh, there's, I want to introduce a sort of singularity of integral affine structures. So what is, uh, what is this singularity? So I'm going to call it an, an I1 singularity. Uh, is gotten by the following surgery.
So what you do is you uh, take some point in R2. And I'm going to sort of draw these two dotted lines. So this is in the direction uh, 0 minus 1. This is in the direction 1 minus 1. And then I'm going to sort of take the complement of this triangle that I've cut out. So I'm going to cut out a triangle from R2, or like maybe a, a half space if I want to put a half space here. And then I want to glue the two sides of the cut together by an element of SL2Z. So So I glue these two uh, edges together by the matrix 1, 1, 0, 1, which sort of identifies this ray with this ray. And so uh, on, at the complement of this sort of corner point, there's a chart to R2. So for instance, if I, you know, at a point here, I just have a chart gotten by inclusion. At a point here, I just have a chart by inclusion. And you know, at a point along the edge here, I can take this and this, and then I can apply this matrix that I've glued by to get a single chart. Um, so this singularity that this introduces uh, is what I want to call an I1 singularity. And there's actually another way to present this singularity. What I can do is I can, so the sort of heuristic picture of this is that you know, maybe I have like a disk and there's like a singularity inside. And the way that I got this picture is by cutting the disk you know, along, some, along this dotted segment. But I can also cut the disk in this direction, and this is just another presentation of the same singularity. So the picture just looks like R2, except the straight lines in the affine structure sort of go like this. Maybe I'll use color for some straight lines. So these are straight lines. in the affine structure. So this is an example, you know, Thurston has this notion of a GX manifold, right? So if a group acts on a space X, you can consider, you know, um, a manifold with charts to x whose transition functions are given by elements of g. And so this is, a, so this is an example of that, where g is the integral affine group and x is r2. OK, so that's, uh, that's uh, the type of singularity that I want to consider. And so, uh, so an integral affine structure affine structure on S2, which uh, I'll abbreviate as IAS2. This was a clever abbreviation of Valeri's, um, is a sphere with um, I1 singularities, is an integral affine structure on a sphere with I1 singularities. And a proposition of uh, uh, Kontsevich and Zoibelman says that uh, there are always 24 such singularities. So this is like an analog of the Gauss-Binet theorem for these integral affine structures. 
You'll note that, like for instance, the integral affine structure on the torus that I drew before, that had no singularities. So, um, because it's you know curvature zero. So. So what is the relationship of these integral affine structures to um, K3 surfaces? So the idea is the following. Um, so the idea is to uh, encode degenerations of K3 surfaces with uh, integral affine structures. So uh, let's recall that we had um, this fundamental domain, K. So this uh, decomposition of hyperbolic space encoded a compactification of the moduli space. So here's, let me draw like a sort of heuristic diagram. Uh, here's the moduli space of degree two K3 surfaces. And then, so for instance, uh, there's one top dimensional cell in this decomposition. And so that means that in the compactification, we add one zero cell. And then, you know, there's some number of codimension, I guess there's uh, 24, in fact, codimension one cells. And so there's 24 one dimensional um, copies of C star in the boundary. And so we've added this stuff to the boundary and gotten some compactification, which is this F2 bar reflection. So the sort of fact that I need to use is that um, the lattice points in this fundamental domain correspond to one parameter degenerations of K3 surfaces. So let's let A be some vector in this fundamental domain. So then A parameterizes a one parameter degeneration of K3 surfaces. So uh, associated to A, is some arc. Um, let me call it a delta A star. So this is some uh, punctured disk. And whichever cell uh, that this vector A lies in, uh, in this polyhedral decomposition, sort of determines, see, this is compact. So if you have a punctured disk mapping in, you can fill in the puncture point. And like which, um, so if A you know, lies in one of these cells, then it hits uh, one of the corresponding strata in the boundary. Sorry? Yeah, so this is a, this is a, this is a punctured analytic disk, yeah, which is mapping into yeah. Oh, this this big thing is F two. So this is nineteen dimensional. So this is something in. So th this stuff that I've drawn here is like in the compact. It's in the boundary of the compactification. So it's the stuff that we've added. Oh, this is the single point that's like in the boundary 
of the moduli space. So yeah, maybe, maybe I should, uh, here, let's see. Yeah, it's a bit hard to, here, something like that. OK, so this, this is all, OK, there. <laughs> So this is all in the interior. The, the punctured disk maps into the interior of the moduli space. It's a degenerating family of K3 surfaces. So there's a corresponding family, let's say x sub a, over the punctured disk. This is a family of smooth K3 surfaces. And the fact that I want to use is that these one-parameter families, they sort of naturally correspond to vectors uh, in this fundamental domain. Is that a um, Is this, or, sorry? Oh, yeah, this isn't, but I mean, this is not, um, this F2 is like this D mod gamma. Right? Yeah, so you have like a, that's right, you have like a holomorphic curve mapping. Right, yeah, so for instance, if you lift to the universal cover here, like you would get a map from the hyperbolic plane into D, right? And so for instance, you know, like the monodromy, like if you take pi one of the puncture disk, that corresponds to some element of gamma which is the, you know, the monodromy of the degeneration, you know? Um, is it geodesic? Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, it's just some holomorphic map. So maybe another way to say it, you have this compactification. And, you know, it's, it's a pretty reasonable space. So you just take, like, a transverse holomorphic arc that goes through a boundary point um, that, and like, such that the rest of the arc goes into the interior of the, of the moduli space. So the question is, um, oh, let me call this XA star, actually. So we have this family of smooth K3 surfaces, which corresponds to this lattice point in the fundamental domain. And what we need to understand is how to fill in that family of K3 surfaces. So we want to add some central fiber over the origin of the disk um, and describe what that central fiber is. So let me sort of draw a picture of that. So we have this X A star over the puncture disk. And this includes into this disk. Um, and we sort of want to build this family uh, in a reasonable way. And so I'm going to just, instead of describing this whole threefold, I want to just describe the central fiber, which is mapping uh, to the origin. So we'll describe for you what surface you like you plug in here, but like not actually how it like smooths to a K3 surface. Okay, so the goal, so the goal is to write down a singular K3. surface, um, let's say x a 0 for any a. OK, so um, how do you do that? Well, we have. Let's recall that this fundamental domain was defined by the property um, that x, so this is the set of x, such that x dot ri is non-negative for all i. So let's let uh, 
a0 let ai equal um, our vector a dot ri. So we produce from like this one parameter arc that's approaching the boundary a collection of 24, um, so these are 24 non-negative numbers. And from these 24 numbers, we're going to build an integral affine structure on the sphere. So let me show a picture of that. So from the values ai, we're going to build an integral affine structure on the sphere with uh, 24 i1 singularities. And somehow this integral affine structure will encode what we should fill in as the central fiber. So let's see. Um, OK, so here's the sort of first part of the construction. So first, uh, take a polygon um, which I'll call P bar. So the polygon is, let's see, where's my uh, pointer? Oh, thanks. Oh, yeah. OK, so this polygon, you should ignore these little uh, indentations into the polygon. So just imagine that this blue line goes straight across here. So using the first 18 values, A0 through A18, you build this polygon. And so this comes back, actually, to your question, Misha. So there's 24 values of the AIs, right? Because there are 24 roots. But this lattice only has rank 19. So there's some linear relations amongst the values AI. And, one of, and two of those linear relations are that this polygon will close. So these values here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, are just multiples of certain fixed vectors. So, so yeah, maybe I'll draw a heuristic uh, diagram. So this is like a more accurate one. But this polygon um, is being built as follows. So I'm laying some vectors end to end. So these vi are in R2, actually in Z2, are fixed. And I'm using 18 of the AI values to build some polygon. And the fact that the polygon closes is two linear relations amongst the AI values. And then you can sort of see also why we need the AI to be positive values. Right? If, we, if some of these AI values were negative, some edges of this polygon would go in the wrong direction. OK. And so then uh, there are these three um, little triangles that I've cut out. OK, so for those three little triangles, we do uh, these, uh, this surgery, which introduces an I1 singularity. So for instance, maybe we have the edge A0, V0. And then what we do is we cut out a triangle like this and glue uh, the two remaining edges of the triangle together. And there's a parameter involved in doing this cut, which is the size of this triangle. And so the size of this triangle is like one of the parameters, A18. So you'll sort of notice that this diagram looks very similar to the previous one. Like so there are 18, uh, the 18 RIs sort of go around the outside and form a circle, um, which you can see here. And then there are these three uh, surgeries that you do. And those correspond to these three nodes, uh, 18, 19, and 20. OK, so what is the result of this? Well. 
So we first take a polygon p bar and do uh, three surgeries uh, to get what I'll call p. So what is p, actually? It's an integral affine structure on a disk. So like the heuristic picture of p, so here's um, So this is supposed to be the top half of a sphere, which is just a disk. So this is my picture of P. So you know these, uh, these two remaining edges are sewn up uh, by the surgeries. OK, so what do we have now? We have an integral affine structure on a disk with three I1 singularities inside and 18 vertices along the boundary. So then what we do is we take two copies of P and glue them together. So, um, so now glue two copies of, and maybe I should put a dependence on these uh, on this vector a. So here's p of a, right? Because that determines the sort of lengths of these boundary edges. So, so glue two copies together. P of A union, uh, I'll call it P of A op. So it's the same integral affine structure on the disk, except for the fact that I've reversed the orientation of the disk. Um, so that actually produces an integral affine structure, a, a new one, according to my definition, because I required the transition functions to be in SL2Z. But, um, so we glue two of these together. And the way that we glue is we sort of glue uh, each edge to each corresponding edge. So the edge you know, labeled by 3 on P gets glued to the edge labeled by 3 on P op. And what this, uh, then there's these corners. And this requires introducing singularities uh, in the affine structure. So, so this introduces. Um, 18 singularities of the affine structure at the vertices of P of A. So I'm going to call this B of A. OK, so, so far all I've done is I've taken you know, 24 positive numbers and use them as instructions to build an integral affine structure on the sphere. Um, OK, so how do you get a degeneration of K3 surfaces from this integral affine structure on the sphere? Well, there's 18, so there's 18 equatorial ones. Then there's three in the top and three in the bottom. So in total, you get 24, which is necessarily the case by that gauss binet formula. And maybe I should remark, this integral affine structure on the sphere admits a natural involution iota. And the K3 surfaces that we were thinking about, those degree 2 K3 surfaces, they also have an involution, which is to switch the two sheets of the double cover. So like this in some sense, so maybe the heuristic of the talk is that this is a tropicalization of a degree 2 K3. And the involution on a degree 2 K3 is so canonical that it's also visible on the tropicalization. The fact that the, that the involution is uh, non-symplectic is reflected in the fact that this involu involution is orientation reversing on the sphere. Um, OK, so in the last uh, four minutes, I want to tell you how to build a singular K3 surface from this picture. So the next step is to triangulate uh, B of A 
into lattice triangles of area 1 half. So for instance, in this picture, we would just triangulate this thing completely uh, into lattice triangles. And I furthermore want to do it in a iota invariant manner. OK, so I've triangulated this into a bunch of lattice triangles of area 1 half. And then. Uh, the final step, so I can sort of just show a picture and then explain. So here's an example. Um, this represents like half of a sphere with certain AI parameters. So like these AI values are like pretty different than the ones that uh, we saw on the previous slide. So this represents, see this blue line here is the equator of the sphere. Um, these are two of the surgeries, this white triangle that's been cut out and this other white triangle that's been cut out are two of the surgeries that were done. And so since this edge is glued to this edge and this to this, we get an integral affine disk. Here's the three singularities inside of the disk and here's the equator of the disk. And then we glue two copies of that together. So I've only shown half of the sphere, the northern hemisphere. And I triangulated it completely into these lattice triangles of area 1 half. And then uh, the idea is to replace every vertex. Um, at every vertex, you see the fan of a toric surface. And so you build that toric surface and glue them together. So uh, you can sort of ignore this if you are not familiar with toric geometry. But at every vertex, So we have this triangulation. And we have an integral affine structure, right? So we take a chart that, say, contains a vertex of the triangulation. And we apply our chart. And what do we see? Well, we see some sequence of primitive integral vectors you know, emanating from the origin of R2. And so this describes, this is a way to, so this describes uh, toric uh, surface. So at every vertex, um, vi, we get a toric surface. And then finally, um, so finally, uh, glue the toric surfaces together. according to the combinatorics of the triangulation. So the, uh, the edges, the sort of gray edges in this picture, represent the, the boundary of the toric surface. So if you have a surface with a C star squared action, the complement of the open torus orbit is some collection of curves. And that's represented in gray. And so, you know, if two vertices are connected by an edge, then you sort of glue those two surfaces together along that one-dimensional torus orbit. And so, um, using the triangulation, that like builds you. So this builds x not of a. And so that tells you like what to fill in in your family of K3 surfaces. And so of course, you have to check that this actually fills in the family. But you know that's sort of the idea. All right, I'll stop there.